welcome inside. So welcome to the evening session, everybody. And the green sign means that the live streamers are with us. Well, they're not streaming live, they're watching us stream live. But welcome everybody. This is Ajahn Brown. Well, I'm not Ajahn Brown, but this is Ajahn Brown. I'm not Ajahn Brown. <laughs> Bob Campbell. This so this is amazing destination. No one and no one. For the evening. <laughs> so someone sent a message. Okay. All right. So I think uh, the questions are already coming. And I think we'll begin. So this evening, myself and Ajahn Brown will answer your questions as best we can. And if we don't, then please ask them again. And uh, do you want to start? Yeah. No, ladies first. There are no ladies. That's true. That was uh, easy. OK. <laughs> uh, I do enjoy blissful moments in my meditation. Complete silence seems to last a few seconds. And the main hindrance being internal narrative. Any advice to proceed as it seems what my mind wants to do? Again, if your mind wants the silence, after a while that's all it ever wants because it's far more beautiful. If you have an internal narrative going on all the time, then the next time you just turn on a, say, a computer, an iPhone, and you watch a part of a movie or a part of a news, and see if what happens when you turn the sound off. This happened to me once when I was on an aircraft, and right in front of me, there's this screen dropped down. And it was showing the, um, the in-flight movie. The point was I never had any headphones. So I didn't know what the narrative was. I couldn't hear the stars. I couldn't have to hear the music. I found out later it was a movie called Armageddon. And because I didn't have any um, access to the narrative or to the music, I was laughing my head off. It looked so stupid, incredibly stupid, when you didn't have the sound to control you. So it's wonderful when you don't have a narrative, you can enjoy life much more. Be quiet and peace. So let's see if you can just enjoy silence more. And when you enjoy silence, it's more important. And then that's where your mind wants to stay much longer in the beautiful silence. It's much more delightful than any narrative. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is very good for me because I had the same problem for many years. So how can one deal with earworms? Not worms in years, but a song that continually plays in one's mind. The mind seems unwilling to turn the sound off or down, even when asked nicely. So before I was a nom, and before I started to meditate, actually, which was 10 years before I was a nom, um, I was really into music and I thought only the best. But unfortunately, when I did my first retreat, I realized that even the worst had gone into my mind and my mind seemed like just a jukebox full of junk. So it was really crazy. It seemed that every song I'd ever heard was right there. But the insight that it gave me was that our minds really are just these receptacles and whatever we put in there kind of comes back at us the minute we have some silence. So the first thing that I realized is that the music I loved was actually quite disturbing to peace because when you first play the music, you think, oh, I'm in control of when I want to hear that song. But actually, when, you, when it comes back at you in the meditation, you realize it's out of your control. You've conditioned your mind that way. So one thing you could learn from this perhaps is to be careful of the songs that you listen to, or even maybe later you'll find you're less inclined to listen to music. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But my um, main strategy, if you like, was not to, to try not to worry about it more than anything else, because it was really difficult to stop. And instead to turn the mind towards my actual meditation object and just let those sounds be there in the background. 
So again, it's that way that the Buddha teaches, one of the five ways that he teaches in the Vitaka Santana Sutta, that's Majjhimanikaya number 20, about the five ways of overcoming thought. And the, the tunes are basically like a thought, right? But they're a little bit automatic. Um, and that particular one is just the ignoring of the sound. Another thing that really helps me whenever there's like wandering thoughts or nowadays I don't really get songs happening too much is to ask my mind, like when there is a moment of quiet, what is my next thought going to be? And then I listen for the next thought to arise. And it's amazing when you ask that question and you listen, you're really on the lookout. That thought hides, it hides like a little mouse in a hole. <laughs> And you're really on the case. And so when mindfulness is poised like that, it actually catches it even before it arises. And at some point you start to see the, the kind of bubbling up of a thought before it actually forms into words. So that's quite an interesting little trick. I don't know if it really works with the songs, but I would say try not to worry about it. And also notice when the songs are not there because it's very unlikely that they're there all the time. And the more you appreciate those times of silence and stillness when the songs aren't, you know, in your mind, the more you'll encourage the silence to grow. So, good luck. And if that doesn't work, you can always, with the thoughts or the songs, try the method of substitution. And I think this is a really good method to use as often as you wish. And I like to just use phases of metta, love and kindness, because it's always wholesome thought. And the Buddha said that if you have thoughts of metta, loving kindness in the mind, it's impossible to have thoughts of ill will at the same time. You just can't do it. It's impossible to have unwholesome thoughts. You can only have one thought at any one time. So if it's a thought of metta, you know that that's part of the path. So that's something else you can do if it's really driving you crazy. Maybe switch your meditation method to do some metta, some loving kindness, and then that will grow some happiness in the mind. Yeah, and that will be more encouraging of peace and silence later on. Okay. When I meditate, and I'm quite a study, sometimes as you explain, the breath disappears. And after a few minutes, it comes back. Is it normal? Or what should I do then, please? When the breath disappears, it should disappear when the mind is really peaceful and still, and there's not many thoughts in the mind. And there's a lot of joy in the mind. So as you're watching the breath in the Anapanasati, if you're observing it, you get to stages five and six, and the 16 steps of Anapanasati. And there just you experience you know, the piti sukha, the joy coming up with the breath. And that is actually how the mind is adding this wonderful appreciation of peace and calm uh, to your breathing. <laughs> And if you have enough piti sukha along with the breath, and when the breath disappears, it's the piti sukha which is left. And when that piti sukha is left, it really inspires the mind, it energizes it. And the breath may not come back for, but you're still breathing, and you're not aware of the breath until a long time later. But if the breath comes back to normal, what should I do then? Just please carry on as you were doing before. Just watch that breathing, uh, calm it down, and after a while it will become joyful again. And maybe next time when the breath disappears, you go into deeper states of meditation. Very good. We actually don't have the next question yet. Ah, here it comes. <laughs> Two of them. <clears throat> I would like to know more about letting go in the history of the donkey and how mindfulness is practiced. Thank you. I'm going to pass that one to you. In the history of the donkey. <laughs> I think it's your simile about the donkey and the carrot. Yeah. But you made that up. Yes, I made, yes. That was one which I uh, constructed, the donkey and the carrots. And what you were really letting go of there if you're letting go of chasing things, you're letting go of doing things. There's a difference between letting go and letting be. Letting go is just not uh, chasing things, being still, 
and letting be, just being kind to whatever's left there. In other words, when you're kind to the present moment, you don't have to do anything. And that's sort of a, a letting this moment be and letting go of trying to change it or get something else. And that's actually a nice simile of the donkey. I created that simile because sometimes when people let go, they stop chasing things, sometimes they complain, well, the meditation falls apart. They can't watch the breath, they can't watch anything. It's like the carrot is moving further away from you. But be patient. Because after a while, when you don't do anything, that's when you see the donkey coming towards you. On the last part of the donkey simile, I always emphasize the importance of kindness and the way I've explained kindness over the years is with the idea of opening the door of your heart unconditionally for whatever is occurring. And this is just that, uh, that little reference to the kindness is by saying to the carrot, carrot, the door of my mouth is open to you, come in. And that's sometimes what we have to do when we're meditating, have that kindness to allow even bliss to come into our mind. It's a strange thing that when you do start to get some deep meditation and bliss starts to appear, so many people either they think that bliss is not part of meditation, that they should be suffering, or Sometimes they feel they don't deserve the bliss. It's you know, too much for them. And that's why that opening the door of your heart for whatever is occurring unconditionally is an important part of meditation. Anyway, there's another question which goes with it about the meaning of life. And that's a simple no, question. Different. Oh, it's a different one. Yeah, this, okay. this bit. How is mindfulness? Okay. And how mindfulness is practiced? Mindfulness is not practiced. It's mindfulness is what happens when you let go. And when you are still, the mindfulness grows more and more strongly. And the type <coughs> of mindfulness, the level of that mindfulness, which I hope you'll experience, is when the mindfulness is so strong that when you go outside, even the carpet, which you're, uh, I'm sitting on right now, you start to appreciate all the different shades and textures of what looks like an ordinary carpet. Your mindfulness is very strong. It starts to look beautiful. It means your mindfulness is strong. And you can see so much which is interesting in whatever is there. And sometimes even the ordinary stuff really takes on a different value. Because your mindfulness is strong, you can see the beauty in it. It's very easy just to focus on it, watch it, and have a wonderful time with it. So that when your mindfulness is very strong, any sort of negativity disappears. Okay, yeah. The next question, I have a question about the meaning of life. Some say one should create one or become the best, or create a meaning or become the best version of oneself. Here we are presented with the art of disappearing or letting go. Please comment, thank you. So firstly, I think the meaning of life is very unique to each person. We have to find our own meaning the things that really matter to us, you know, the reason that you're here, what best use can you really make of your life? And for me, I think in my teens, that was a burning question, so much so that I was unable to commit to doing any kind of university degree because I didn't really know who I was or why I was here. So it was really important for me to have some understanding of the meaning of life. And I kind of intuited that it had to do with compassion, it had to do with ending suffering. And so when I heard the Buddha's teachings, to me, it seemed to encompass all of that. And I think that is very um, related to the next part of your question about uh, becoming the best version of oneself and then also disappearing or letting go. So perhaps those two things to you seem to be opposites or maybe in contradiction. 
But in terms of the Buddhist path, I would say that becoming the best version of ourself, I mean, we might not frame things in terms of a self, but certainly it's important to develop good qualities within our hearts. And that's where the Buddhist practice teaches virtue. And virtue is a prerequisite for any kind of practice. You know, so we have to focus on developing beautiful qualities of the heart, like the kindness and compassion, you know, understanding that all beings suffer. And just like us, they want to be free from suffering. Nobody wants to remain in suffering or cause harm to anybody else. So when we realize that common humanity and that we basically all want happiness, then it inspires us to develop virtue in our lives and to be really careful not to cause harm as far as we can. And then the practice of mindfulness and the rest of the Eightfold Path helps to support that because we're learning you know, how we use our minds in ways that are harmful and how we can use our minds in ways that heal and help other beings and ourselves. And so it's on the basis of this virtue that we gain confidence, first of all, we gain confidence in ourselves, we gain confidence in the Buddha's teachings, and then joy kind of start arising in the mind and that joy develops the mindfulness, the mindfulness becomes strong. And the more joy that you get from inside yourself rather than outside in the world of sensuality, sensual pleasure and stimulation of the senses, the more you're able to let go of those things that don't really cause you true benefit and that actually can cause you harm. So it's on the basis of that virtue, we're almost creating like a more refined taste for happiness, like a different kind of happiness, the happiness of blamelessness, the happiness of um, unsullied happiness, it says in the Buddhist, uh, in the Buddhist text, something like the, the, the happiness that starts to become internal rather than dependent on the senses. And then because of that, it becomes easier to let go. Yeah. And all the suffering disappears because remember, it's not, um, I mean, you can say that it's the, that it's us that's disappearing, but really what's disappearing is this whole mass of suffering, you know, nothing more than that. The Buddha taught suffering and the end of suffering. And for me, that's very clearly the meaning of my life. So find out what leads you to more happiness and what reduces suffering for you, because I'm sure nobody wants to inflict suffering on themselves or anyone else. Anything to add? I've been trained in a tradition where we meditate around 10 to 11 hours each day. Being relaxed and listening to my body is therefore pretty new to me. I could push myself to sit more formal meditation, but I didn't today. I ended up sleeping over 12 hours and had a nap too. I'm a young woman with a relatively balanced lifestyle and did know I was so exhausting. However, now I feel a hint of guilt coming in. It tells me I'm wasting my time and I should be sitting more. How can one balance discipline with relaxation? And what's the difference between laziness, indulgence and self-care? Thank you. It's a very good question because many people feel that in order to get uh, some depth in one's meditation, one needs some discipline and sit hour after hour after hour. It's not the amount of meditation you do that is important as much as the quality of that meditation. And in my life as a monk, I've seen many other monks try to do that long hours of meditation and have found that they get so tight that their mind can never go to the deeper meditations. And when one is relaxed and listen to your body, then the body is far more healthy and at ease, which means that it's much easier to let go of the body. And I always remember just how the Buddha taught in the middle way, not doing anything which exhausts or tires the body, and not indulging in the five senses. And in that teaching, he excluded the pleasures of the mind. He said those are the pleasures that one should pursue and not be afraid of. 
And that becomes the middle way. And because of that middle way, which is very hard for people to understand, that one can um, still even meditate more than 10 and 11 hours a day. And, but you're not, you don't have to. It becomes just what the body and the mind want to do, what they incline towards. Uh, I don't know actually how you can do 10 to 11 hours of formal meditation each day and still have a life. Obviously, that you, know, that you were sleep deprived and you spent 12 hours and had a nap as well. That's a lot of sleeping. And that obviously meant that you, know, you were sleep deprived. And it's also well known in medicine that if you don't get enough sleep, you get very sickly, not just physically, but mentally as well. It says you are a young woman with a relatively balanced lifestyle. Because you're a young woman, you have some endurance and health. If you try to do that sort of practice when you're middle-aged or old, it becomes very dangerous to your health. And the feeling guilt coming in, it tells me I'm wasting my time. You can't say it's wasting your time when you know, you're looking after your body and keeping it healthy. It's better to have that healthy lifestyle where you have enough sleep, because otherwise you spend time in hospital, you spend time in pain, and that really is wasting time. I should be sitting more. <coughs> So again, don't look upon the length of time. Look upon the depth and the peace and the beauty of one's meditation. When that starts to really take off, you enjoy the meditation. The body does disappear easily and you get into very blissful states of mind. Then you will find that the meditation is not wasted at all. And it becomes gorgeous. Ah, okay. So, although I'm aware that life isn't ifable, that's one of Ajahn Bam's sayings, you can't uh, look back on the future and say, if only, and you can't predict an outcome, I found myself struggling to make any decisions out of fear, but I'm not sure what kind of fear, which leads to stress and anxiety, which leads to inaction, which leads to indecisions, and so on. How do I break this vicious circle and let go? So not making any decisions out of fear. So it's an interesting one because I, I often um, have periods of doubt in my life. And when I am in a state of doubt, I know it's not a good time to make a decision. So I've kind of made a little personal rule that if in doubt, don't. Or if in doubt, just wait it out. Um, but here you say that you're struggling out of fear but you're not sure what kind of fear so I would personally practice to get in touch with that fear and really find out what it is I think that could be a very interesting exploration because fear is something we usually run away from and we don't really want to have a look at and then maybe by that awareness of the fear you'll find that it starts to dissolve and you get a little bit more clear about what it is that's causing that hesitation and that's causing that stress and anxiety I wouldn't push yourself too much because then you may make decisions not out of fear, but just out of a sense of irritation or kind of, you know, restlessness or, or the like. Um, but how do you break this vicious circle and let go? Yeah, eventually, if you have to make a decision, I think it's just looking at what may cause the most potential benefit for yourself and others. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. And then just giving it all your energy to make it work. That's something I've learned from Ajahn Brown. You can never predict how things are going to work, but you can influence your attitude towards them. So although we can't really control life, we can influence the way we respond. And that can be really helpful. So obviously, if you have to make a decision that's really, you know, you have to make it quickly and it's really important, then try to think which one might be the most virtuous, which one, I don't know, brings some joy to your heart. Because some decisions, we do them more like as a duty Others we do because actually we find that it lights something up inside of us and that way we can really give 
our heart to it. So see what it is that's really calling you. And if you do have a chance to explore a little bit more deeply, I would consider doing that as well simultaneously. Is that okay? If, if one no, atom bomb is wanting always a bad thing, for example, I wanted to be on this retreat, mm -hmm. they get me into trouble because of the wanting. That was the past because you're on this retreat. But also, the wanting gets you into trouble when you are meditating. As I've often said to the monks in my monastery, that all the effort, all the wanting stops when you've got your bottom on the meditation seat. And you've arrived at this place, don't want anything more. Just allow the meditation to happen. Otherwise, wanting is always pushing you somewhere in the future. You get on the cushion, but you want to be somewhere else. Which means you never find any stillness, peace, bliss or happiness. This wanting just keeps going on and on and on. Even the beautiful wanting, wanting to help other people. But eventually, you, know, you have to find some stillness somewhere. Otherwise, that helping other people is not helping them at all. Just carrying on the, uh, the whole process of samsari. Just going round and round and round. Wanting drives samsara. And the only way to stop that samsara is to have to deal with you when nothing is wrong in the whole world. It's a very beautiful experience. There have been times as a monk when people said, You've helped me so much. Is there anything I can give you? Is there anything you want? And those few times I've responded, and it, it was true. I mean, with being honest, I don't want anything. I'm happy right now. I'm happy right now. I don't want anything. So you must want something. I said, no. Where's the moment of peace? The stillness. What we call contentment. If you want something, you're not content. Other times, I remember just uh, doing work. as a senior monk. had all the papers in my hand. One of my friends, who used to be a monk before, just ask me, Ajahn Brahm, where are you going? I said, well, I'm getting there. So comes then, and he said, getting where? And I looked to him, said, thank you. Because the only place I'm going is the cemetery, which is the truth of the matter. And so I, now I say, when people ask me, how are you? Instead of saying, I'm getting there, I am say, I'm being here. It's a much better answer. When you're being here, you don't want anything in the whole world but at peace. That's a beautiful feeling. Try it. So the next question is, I prefer to sit with legs crossed for meditation, but after half an hour, I can feel they've gone completely numb and are very painful when I eventually move them. What to do? So it's interesting. We want, we have a certain like preference for what our body you know what we want our body to do but the body doesn't want to do that <laughs> so i think in this particular case it's a matter of um learning to respect our body a little bit and respect its limitations because so often we really just want to push our body around and make it work for us so one thing i would say is um maybe ask your body what it wants and, and just give it that little bit more care and then your body you may find that your body cooperates with you a little bit more so another thing you can do, of course, when you do sit cross-legged is try to adjust your posture, maybe put an extra cushion, maybe something under your knees or something like that. Because sometimes there can be just a nerve that gets trapped in a particular place and it can be just a matter of adjusting really carefully exactly where your cushion goes. Like for me, I get sciatic pain, but if I have it just under the very back of my buttocks, but not slightly kind of twisted around so that the right one's a bit more released <laughs> then it can really make the difference between whether I can sit for an hour or, or longer so you might be able to experiment a little bit but I would also say let your body choose from time to time yeah and maybe try sitting on a chair or you can even try something like a footstool no not a footstool a meditation stool 
you know, one of those little things that you get on the floor. So you're still on the floor, like you still feel grounded on the floor, but there's not so much pressure on maybe a certain nerve. I mean, for me, my legs go numb on those little things, but everybody's different. So don't worry too much. I mean, the most important thing in meditation is actually on the position of your mind. So it's really about your attitude that you have towards your body and towards whatever meditation object you experience. That's the thing that's going to get you enlightened, not the way that you sit. Okay, can you explain the gatekeeper, how it works in practice related to meditation in daily life? The best way of using the idea of a gatekeeper is if there is, say, meditation, some problem which keeps coming up. In other words, you, know, you start to get peaceful and then you just go backwards, so you start thinking. Starting with the deep meditation, you get excited, whatever it is. But what you do with the gatekeeper, I usually call it programming your mindfulness these days. So you tell yourself at the beginning of the meditation when instructions aren't very disturbing at all, you say, if I start to um, say, see a beautiful light in the meditation, you say, I will not get excited, I will not get afraid. I will not get excited, I will not get afraid, I will not get excited, I will not get afraid. You say that in the beginning of the meditation and you forget about all those instructions and you meditate and you get to the point you're getting quite deep in your meditation and maybe a beautiful light appears, these are called nematodes. And when they do appear, this what happens is you have this automatic gatekeeper comes up and says, no, I'm not going to be afraid. It doesn't actually say that, it just avoids you know, the problem, like an antivirus you put in the computer, that antivirus kicks in in your mind, because you've told the mind at the very beginning when it's not so disturbing. And that gatekeeper can avoid any of the difficulties or problems arising. And that's how it works in practice. How it works in daily life is pretty much the same. Suppose you have an appointment, you're supposed to phone you know, your mother because it's her birthday tomorrow or something. Again, you tell yourself, oh, tomorrow I must you know, call my mother at 3 p.m. Tomorrow I must call my mother at 3 p.m. Tomorrow I must call my mother at 3 p.m. And then what happens, you know, you find that your mind will remember that. And at 3 p.m. you think, oh, I've got to call somebody. Oh, during this retreat, if you want to experiment with this, I don't know what time you go to bed tonight, but when you do go to bed, and you tell yourself as you're laying in your bed, just about to um, get nice and comfy before you fall asleep, you tell yourself, I will wake up at 5 a.m. I will wake up at 5 a.m. I will wake up at 5 a.m. Or whatever time you want to get up. And then you put an alarm clock up to five past five a.m. just so you don't get afraid. And then you're amazed at how effective that is. When I first tried that, I was waking up for one or two minutes either side of the time I told myself to wake up. And it made it very easy to not to worry too much about things. So that gatekeeper was this part of your mind, which can tell you what to do, can stop you doing things. And you establish that you know, by programming your mindfulness, giving yourself clear instructions in your own language, simple, repeated three times with as much mindfulness as you can muster up. And you find then it works. You don't have to worry. Okay. All right, the next question is not an easy one, but I'll have a go and then hand over to you okay. to see if you can clarify. Okay. <laughs> so please, can you clarify some definitions? Mind means simply every type of mental activity. Is ego synonymous with self and self-image? 
So Ajahn knows much more about the mind than I do, but I would understand the mind not necessarily as every type of mental activity. In fact, I would say that the mental activity is more the sankara, kanda. So it's the mental, perhaps, reactivity. It's the response that we have to the objects that come into the mind. Whereas the mind, to me, is something that's more passive. It's the knowing of those mental objects, any of the objects of the five senses, and then also the object of the sixth sense itself, which is usually a kind of thinking or memory of those five senses. But it's only in the deeper meditation that you can start to see the mind without those five senses being interfering. So at first, for example, when you meditate, you don't see sight anymore. <clears throat> and then later on, you stop hearing sounds. Yeah? And then maybe actually before that, the feelings in the body usually start to disappear or dissolve and the body becomes extremely light and maybe even disappears. And so then we start to see the mind without all those other senses going on and the mind becomes increasingly passive and, and really moves into a sort of knowing sense. So the second part of the question is about ego and whether it's synonymous with self and self image. I'm not sure about in the Western understanding, but in the Buddhist understanding, when we talk about the sense of self, we're really talking about two main areas that the sense of self um, kind of assumes itself and takes possession of things. And that's usually um, the self as the doer, what it does, yeah? and the self as the knower, what it knows. So these are the two kind of main aspects of the self as we understand it in Buddhism, but also the self is known by what it owns. So that's a sometimes easier way to understand what the sense of self is. Like when you think my body or my mind, my perception, my moods, you know, my family, my job, all the things that we identify around and that we think we own. And you can also see where there's a strong sense of self by where there's a lot of suffering. Like the things that, you know, you really cling to are the things that are going to cause more suffering in your life. You know? So, for example, you think where I cling is usually around wanting to be like in the perfect monastery. <laughs> you know, the kind of sense of self that comes around being a nun and the sort of idea of the perfect monastic life. And then I can tell that there's clinging there because when that doesn't happen, I suffer. <laughs> So we all identify with something, even monastics, you know, unless we're really enlightened, we will tend to identify with something. And it's usually where you find it difficult to let go is, is the clue as to where, what you're still taking to be a sense of self. I don't know if that's anything Met that you want to say more about the mind. Yeah, okay. Mental activity, especially, even in the, the suttas, the mental activity is just uh, mental ideas of the five senses. It's still five sense activity. And what you call mental activity, you're thinking about sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, complicated <coughs> all of those. And what real mental activity is, is where the mind, you can only see those in deep meditation, with just the mind, there's no reference to the five senses at all, pure mind activity. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha said to really understand the mind is not something you can see through reasoning. It's only things which you can see by experience. And how can you know what that experience is? When the five senses have disappeared, and what you have left is very pure awareness, totally separated from the five senses, and that becomes the mind, what we call the jitta. And if there's any part of those five senses left, it's very hard to understand the nature of the mind. The Buddha's simile was just like gold. If you are chemist and want to find the nature of gold, you have to make sure there's no other elements you know, in that gold. It really is 100% pure gold. If you want to understand what the mind is, it has to be 100% pure with no sights, smells, tastes, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, or thoughts about those. You can't have like the echoes of the five senses uh, in the mind. 
and uh, once it's free of all those, it's a really impure mind, then you can actually start to expel the of its power. To do things like remember past lives, to do things like get into a really blissful space, and to do things like understanding this, how this mind works and how it is you know, the cause you know, of those defilements. Understand that you know, it is, as General Chandra said, you know, we can measure the mind by the doer and the knower. And that's one of the reasons why when I stop doing things, it challenges who you think you are. And when the, the knowing starts to refine itself and the consciousness starts to vanish and disappear. And then if you may be afraid of that, you think, what am I practicing for to disappear? And you find out that's the greatest peace and happiness. And the ego is a sense of self which is so afraid that it tends to build itself up in a castle, a very strong castle. And the main parts of those castles are the doer and the knower. To challenge those is a very difficult thing to do. And a big ego is usually built up by so much striving. The more you strive and succeed, the more you think that you, know, you did it. And that ego results. Okay. So a nice comment, first of all, glad to see such a happy Sangha gathered at the Oxford Vihara. Yeah, it's actually the Anukampa Buddhist Vihara, yeah. because there is an Oxford Buddhist Vihara. So just not to confuse the two, there's an Oxford Buddhist Vihara 10 minutes walk away, which is rather wonderful, because that has some very um, supportive Burmese monks. So I'm going to make a, we do have a little connection already, but they're being very friendly and reaching out to us here. Um, so we're going to call this probably the Anukampa Buddhist Vihara, um, just so that you know who we are. Uh, so that's great that it makes you happy. And you say that you're inspired and grateful for the opportunity to hear teachings from such happy people. Metta to you all. Wonderful. And you're one of them, John, and you're somebody who, sorry, oh, yeah. maybe I shouldn't say your name, but you're somebody that also gives us so much support. So everybody here is part of this community. You know, we can't be happy and smiley and teach the Dhamma without your support. So it's really a credit to everybody here that we have such a place to practice and that we can teach this retreat from here as well, which is really conducive. And I know that Ajahn Brown is really appreciating it too, yeah. which brings a lot of happiness to me because he's been such an enormous part of making this possible. So thank you to everybody here and of course to our teacher, Ajahn Brown. So the next question is, do you recommend standing meditation on a retreat? And if so, how should we do it? So I'm not sure that either myself or Ajahn Brown generally teach it very much. I haven't heard you teach it. But um, sometimes I do standing meditation and sometimes another of my teachers, Bhante Ujagara, has recommended it as a way to bridge that little, all those gaps, you know, in, in your day, especially gaps in the mindfulness, simply by adding another posture, because ultimately, you know, we have to learn to develop this mindfulness along with the kindness, including the gatekeeper and including the sense restraint and the virtue in everything we do. Right. And so the more we can practice that awareness, that presence in the various postures, the more we can start to piece together, if you like, all the gaps in our awareness and those areas where we lose um, our sense of what the proper thing to do might be. So the standing meditation can be helpful also when you may be tired or sleepy or you just want to give a change to the body. I also find it very helpful for when the mind is a little bit um, timid or maybe even anxious because you're literally taking a stand, right? And if you stand in a really um, balanced way and you plant your feet in the floor, perhaps like bend a little bit on your knees, like just to make sure they're springy and, um, you know, make sure your hips are kind of balanced over your knees, your feet are directly under your knees. 
and you know you maybe roll your shoulders back and hang your arms to the side in a relaxed way it gives you a sense of uprightness and a sense of confidence and um groundedness yeah that can be really very nice for the mind it can give the mind the same sort of sense because you'll notice that like the postures change the state of your mind like if you're lying down the mind's more likely to become relaxed so relaxed it starts to snore perhaps <laughs> or maybe you just become you know energized again if you're sleepy um sometimes i meditate lying down and just kind of do a very a very kind of unstructured body scan and just try to infuse my body with a feeling of loving kindness and that can be really rejuvenative so yeah try the standing meditation and find your own way to do it but certainly make sure you're balanced. And the other thing, the caveat is, if you have any kind of blood pressure issues or kind of any other, um, I don't know, maybe obviously something like Parkinson's or something where you might not be able to stand too long, then please open your eyes. You can still do it with your eyes open. You know, you just look a couple of meters ahead. And usually you can only do it for a shortish time because it takes some time to build up uh, the strength in that posture. So try it maybe for 10 minutes or don't even give yourself a time, you know. Um, but I think it can be helpful just as a little um, addition to your practice. It's always good to have many different tools in the box. So. Okay, the next question. What does it mean to fully understand suffering? Does this mean the experiences of it, the feelings in body and mind, the perceived causes of it, how to actualize this in daily life? Again, I love that question because it brings to mind the simile of the tadpole and the frog. A tadpole which was born in the water, grew up in the water, lived all its life in the water. How could that tadpole ever understand water? How could it fully understand water when it's been in the water all the time? It can't understand the nature of water. No one of the fish can understand the water. But um, when that tadpole uh, grows these appendages, these legs and arms, and when it becomes a frog, then one day the little tadpole jumps out of, becomes a frog and jumps out of the water onto the dry land. And that's the first time the frog as the opportunity for understanding what water was when it disappears. And that's the same thing with suffering. The only time we can really understand suffering is when it starts to disappear in the deep meditations. We have something like our body. How can we really understand what the body is? When we were born in the body, lived all our life in the body and know nothing else but the body. But with meditation, sometimes the body totally disappears and our mindfulness is very strong. And it's also very blissful. And the bliss is because the body, which was a whole heap of suffering, no matter how fit and healthy you are, the body has disappeared. Now you know just how that body was suffering. It's similar to the effect which people have in what we know we call the out of the body experiences when people die. Because when they do die, they many people feel a great sense of relief and peace. This is a, a story which was a BBC documentary. And they were interviewing this one lady who you know, had so many physical problems in her life. And then when she was of being operated on, she left her body and it was so much peace and freedom that when, this is just what she said online, you don't have to believe in it, but the simile is brilliant. She said that when she met this spirit on the other side, this spirit said to her, it's not your time yet, you have to go back. And she replied, no way I'm going back, I'm staying here. The spirit said, but you have to go back. And they had an argument on the psychic plane. And then eventually, eventually, they said, no, you have to go. Because they said, you have to go. She still refused. 
and they grabbed her and threw her back into her old body. And when she was being interviewed by the BBC, she said, mm. of course I'm going to die one day, and when I really die, the first thing I'm going to do is find that spirit, and you wouldn't believe what I'm going to do to him. When he threw me back into this old body, which was so painful, I'll never forgive that, never. But what that sort of told me, like I've heard so many times, things I know, is that when you leave the body, you realize how painful this body was. Even when you think it's healthy, it still hurts. So when things disappear, and it feels beautiful when they disappeared, then you know just how, what suffering really was. Super. Um, some people have asked that we speak up a little, so sorry to okay. those who can't hear properly, but we'll do our best. Um, so the next question is, uh, please can you explain what the Thai Ajans refer to as Buddha? It is often translated as that who knows or similar things, and I find it very confusing. Okay, does it belong to the self? Is it vinyana or is it something else? And how to practice it in the right way and not only repeating some Pali word? So firstly, I would like to say that not all the Thai Ajans um, use this method. It's a method that's popular, I think, in Northeast Thailand, but not everybody um, does because sometimes, you know, it's easy for some traditions to kind of monopolize the whole teachings of the entire forest tradition and there are many different teachers there. So I think that you're perhaps confusing two different methods here. One is the use of the word Buddha, which is actually the word Buddha, but in the, is it a nominative case? Is that right? Anyway, it just means the Buddha. So it's like saying the word Buddha again and again and again. And for people with very strong faith, especially in Buddhist countries, that can be inspiring of a lot of joy, a lot of confidence, and probably a great deal of energy and mindfulness as well. So they use it as a kind of mantra in a way as substitution, you know, the first of these five ways of dealing with unwholesome thoughts or any kind of thoughts that the Buddha teaches in the Vitaka Santana Sutta. So it's just popping that thought into the mind and then listening with the heart about what that really means to you. And that can be very helpful for some people to get into some kind of state of stillness and calm. So it's a skillful means rather than um, a doctrine of any kind. <clears throat> you can use other uh, mantras too. What's your favorite? Shut up. Yeah. Up <laughs> for Westerners, but I don't think it has quite the same uh, uplift. <laughs> but you know, you could you could use any word that might help you to become calm and peaceful. Sometimes I love to use the word peace, and I just say that word to myself internally, peace, and then listen to the word, listen to the meaning, listen to the direction that word points the mind. So the next part of your question, so is a bit different, um, but yes, sometimes the Thai Ajans translate chitta as that who knows, right? Chitta, isn't it? No, it's even the Buddha. They use that the Thai word was guru. Okay. It's basically that the one who knows. Ah, so. so it actually came from some members of the ah. forest tradition, especially Ajahn Phan. He started this, okay. and they called it the one who knows. Mm -hmm. and they elevated the idea of the one who knows as being equivalent to the enlightened one or the Buddha. And it was confusing. It was in error, but you cannot sort of um, criticize some of those monks, especially one of the monks who took up that idea was also the teacher of the former king of Thailand. And so to criticize the king's teacher was a very difficult thing to do. Uh, even to criticize you know, the royal family's dog got people put in jail. And because, oh yes, because the hierarchical system there, then you couldn't even give ordination to bhikkhunis, not because it was wrong, it's because those at the top didn't want it, mm. and you're not supposed to question your teachers. So it is confusing, 
and you know, the one who knows it's not just mindfulness it's almost like positing a self a personal personality which survives everything even nirvana you just become the one who knows after nirvana it's a very satisfying concept but it's totally against how the buddha taught and that's one of the reasons why it became popular because it's what people wanted to hear mm. rather than what the Buddha taught. And that kind of fits in with this idea of how we cling to the sense of self as the one who knows, right? So yeah. it's not that it's an aspect of the self, it's an aspect of the delusion of a self, yes, right? Because it's one of the places that we assume a self where there is actually only a process. So there is no, even mind, I find that a strange term, quite honestly, because mm. to me, it's a process yes, yeah. of mind consciousness. And of course, it can, you can describe it as mind because it's mind consciousness, but mind consciousness also is subject to dissolving, changing, disappearing. So it's really a process that has a cause and that when that cause is removed, it has an end. Correct. So I think I explained about how to use words in a useful way yes. already. Okay, do you want to do this one, Ajahn? Okay, in meditation, one morning. Maybe about, the last one. Okay, one morning about six weeks ago, it became very deep and silent, and I stopped thinking as well, and I felt like I had fallen down a hole and everything vanished. So you're still mindful, because then in front of me appeared a brightness of deep love. Mm -hmm. I suddenly felt I know you as I was relaxing into this. A second thought appeared which told me that it didn't I don't didn't deserve this and my mind left. Was this a nimitta? It may be even more than a nimitta. It could be just what sometimes I call a ping pong jhana because you had a brightness, deep love. Many people uh, interpret the bliss of the first jhana as deep love. It's amazing just how the, the experience of pure deep love is so similar to just pure bliss, which is the name we give it. I suddenly felt, I know you. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, as I was relaxing into this. And a second thought appeared, which told me that I didn't deserve this. That's the thing which I was most taken by in your uh, question, because that happens to so many people. I don't know why they do that, but often we've been conditioned to feel that there's something wrong with us, that we're not good enough. We're told that by our parents who are supposed to love us, they're always trying to push us to do better every time. You can understand why people do that. But we come away with that after many years of not being good enough. The same when you're at school. Some teachers always try to encourage you by saying you're not good enough, thinking that that will impel you to greater achievements. We come away from that feeling there's something wrong with us. There's something which we don't have, which other people have. And that comes out in the meditation by saying, I didn't deserve this, and your mind left, which to me was like a great tragedy. Everybody on this planet deserves jhanas and even enlightenment, unless you've done some of these deeds, which the Buddhists call Adharika uh, Kama, like you have deliberately killed your mother or deliberately killed your father. That's about all of created a schism in the Sangha. Sorry? Yeah. And again, and also violated a bhikkhuni. Before they thought they couldn't do that because there's no bhikkhunis around. <laughs> this is I'm talking about ties. But of course there are bhikkhunis. So that's the sort of thing which would cause you not to be able to get into jhanas and not to be able to get enlightened. So if you tick off that list, you haven't raped a bhikkhuni. You haven't caused a schism in the Sangha. You haven't killed your mother or your father. You take those lists off. And if you haven't done any of those, you do deserve 
for deep meditations. You do deserve stages of enlightenment. But what you don't deserve is to feel you don't deserve these beautiful states <laughs> of mind. You don't deserve that at all. Should we do one or two more? Yes, yeah, go for it. As Renji. It's okay, yes. Yes. If these are really deep, I'm giving them to you. Mm -hmm. It's actually they've addressed it to me. Where? The end of it. Okay, go for it. Oh yeah. Uh, for many years, I thought I was in question here, Sister London no. Damadina. Yeah, okay. But for many years, I thought in my enlightenment was all I wanted to attain. Then I got scared and thought I don't want to get enlightened because then it could make me strange from my family. I know that means I'm still very attached to my family. Could you please help me with this Ajahn Brahm? Thank you. You can't, if you want to attain enlightenment, you never will. So the wanting stops you. So the only way that enlightenment happens for you is when you abandon all, invite, all wanting, when you are content. And that contentment just grows into more states of enlightenment and into states of enlightenment. But you have a family, it really depends on how old or young your family are. If there are young kids, then you know, your young kids would really enjoy you meditating more, becoming closer and closer to enlightenment. So often over in Australia, when I do regular classes on meditation, sometimes like mothers, tell me they never wanted to come to the meditation group this evening. Their children sent them, Mummy, you have to go to meditation. No, I'm too tired, says Mummy. But you have to go, says their kids. Why? I've just come back from work, I'm tired. Mummy, you have to go. Why? Because you're a much nicer mummy after you return from meditation. Kids can see. You know, there's the improvement in you as you practice on the path to enlightenment. Even your uh, partner can see just the improvements. So often the, the partner sends you know, you know, the, the partner to the meditation the retreats. And so they can't stand them when they just get so cranky. So go to a meditation retreat. It's like sending your car to the garage to get tuned up. You become a much nicer wife, a much nicer husband after doing some meditation. Yes, you're getting close to enlightenment, but it's a long journey to enlightenment. It will take you some time. But on the way, you become a much happier being and not getting estranged from your family, but your family gets closer to you. And as you get really, really close and you want to become a monk or a nun, I think it's wonderful to see all those people who I ordain, they have got children. Usually if they've got very young children who are dependent upon them, I will never ordain them. But sometimes they have children they can do without their mum or without their dad. And they, you know, they're 16 or 17 or whatever. And they just really appreciate that their parent is a monk or a nun with great compassion and great wisdom. Your family will never lose out. They'll always benefit. Okay, I'm just going to answer the next one, if that's okay. Yeah, because course, yeah. um, this person lives in a Theravada free area of Norfolk, which is a shame because we almost came there to uh, do our retreat this year. Well, we were going to come, but unfortunately the venue closed. So Theravada Buddhism feels like home to me. Other schools are represented locally. New Kadampa tradition, Dodgy. Sri Ratna and Zen. How can I maintain my practice with Theravadism from a distance? So the obvious answer that I would like to recommend is to come to Anukampa's online teachings because these days with the online teachings, uh, it doesn't really matter where you live. And you know, Norfolk's not a million miles away. So there are Theravada monasteries in this country. There are obviously um, the big monasteries that already exist. 
and there's also this new little place here so if you ever want to come and stay so long as we have a place and there's a female chaperone because I think you're a male then you're very very welcome but otherwise to attend any of the online teachings that we do probably 50 percent maybe of the people here on this group now are from my online group and we've been running that for about two and a half years now and we've done many of these online uh, retreats as well so it's a really lovely group and even though it just looks like little kind of one and a half inch boxes on your screen it's incredible that when we meet each other we feel we know each other already and there's a really a lot of warmth and care so there is opportunity not only to hear the teachings from myself from Ajahn Brah, Ajahn Brahmali and other bhikkhunis who I invite um, there's also the opportunity to meet each other we have some discussion times and it's a really good way to tap into something that can feed your heart because I do think it's important to find something that resonates for you and personally for me I'd rather do it remotely than be with people that I'm you know I'm not quite on a wavelength with obviously there's loads of other online stuff and you want to create something more locally but if you do um you know deepen your practice continue your practice I would also recommend starting a little group near you so you know just put a little notice up maybe in a health food shop or a yoga shop and say you know anybody want to come meditate at my home if you've got that kind of a facility or even hire a little place and do some meditation or take a little book of suttas and just have some discussion there but we will start our online stuff again in December after this retreat with sutta discussions every week and we'll see what else is there some meta chanting and some dhamma talks from time to time as well so uh, hopefully you can maintain your practice that way and remember that the best teacher is always the buddha so if you have um, some suttas and if you have good teachers who can help to bring those alive for you i think this makes you really independent and strong in the practice as well so do you want to just answer this one and then we close for the day quite easy quite easy yeah in relation to the components of existence of today's sutta all it really means is that, oh, yeah. yeah, it's not just bodies or uh, experience or perceptions of you, but of all beings, whether they're really close to you or like uh, in Oxford, or they're far in Norfolk, <laughs> or they're even further in Australia, that it includes everybody. The tribe of the Buddha is making sure that everything which is called a body, everything which is called experience, everything which is called perception, everything which is called will, everything which is a consciousness, any of the six consciousnesses, wherever they are, you know, far or near, everything you know, in this universe or other universes, just all consciousnesses. And it's interesting how You'll probably get a question on this afterwards. There is one sutra in the Ankuta and the Akai which says there are aliens. Hmm. People not of this solar system. So that's what it means, far or near. I'll explain that next time. Hang out. We're coming back at the same place at the same time. And you can answer about aliens. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Sad. 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 Sad.